three or four months ago on the topic of board engagement and security metrics and why cybersecurity is these days a, a boardroom issue, why we still as CISOs and security leaders having challenges conveying the important metrics and indicators that we need to, to materially lower risk, to justify expenditure, etc. So about 25 minutes and I've got some time for questions. So who am I and why am I here today to talk about cybersecurity and metrics? So I'm the CISO for the EMEA region over at Tanium. Prior to that, this was interesting from the previous talk, I spent some time over at Zscaler or Zscaler, depending on which side of the pond you're from, where well, I was also their CISO, but also their data protection officer. So a number of the points that we had in the previous session were particularly interesting. To me, and various other things I do in the industry, a lot of work with Holloway, so I go there as a guest lecturer from time to time, primarily around <coughs> cloud security, risk management, etc. And that's what my uh, dissertation there was actually on, demystifying some of the risks of public cloud computing. Uh, the reason I'm actually here today is Steve and I are fellow board members of the IISP. Um, it's an organisation that I've been involved with now for coming up to three years and plan to be involved with for the foreseeable future. My role there kind of primarily focuses on what we call our masterclass series. So working with academia, working with various members of the IISP on various things across our skills framework. So I think we have a last night, Steve, on vulnerabilities and pen testing, I think, and uh, another one in a couple of weeks' time, but I'll be running around actor motivations and threat intelligence along with threat modeling, which I'm looking forward to. So kind of the meat of the talk, as I said earlier, you know, if cybersecurity is a boardroom issue, then why do we still have these challenges with getting funding and reduce risk in our environments. And to be brutally honest, I don't necessarily blame board members for kind of having a feeling of maybe cyber apathy. They hear every day in the news that there's the latest and greatest breach, that every actor out there is highly sophisticated. There's almost a futility, or there feels like a futility, of applying any controls in your environment. At any time you open up Forbes, Bloomberg, Reuters, you're hearing about how cyber security spend is on the increase. And there doesn't really appear to be any alignment of increased spending and reducing risk, which is ultimately what we as CISOs are kind of there to do, which is a real challenge. And there was a video from a rather famous television program, and I think sums up some of the challenges that we have in cybersecurity with conveying the right messages. And what are you doing with my computer? Um, it's not your computer, is it? It's one and a what are you doing with one box computer? You don't need to know. No, I don't need to know. Could you tell me anyway? I'm installing a file. Yeah. Okay, what's that? Protects your computer against script kiddies, data collectors, viruses, worms, and Trojan horses, and it limits your outbound internet communications. Any more questions? Yes. How long will it take? Why well, do you want to do it yourself? No, I can't do it myself. How long will it take you without interest? It'll take as long as it takes. Right. Um, how long did it take last time? It does. Right, thank you. So, I know there's a bit of a joke there, but if you kind of put yourself in tin shoes, that's how I feel we, <coughs> some consumers of security services are from time to time. I think you asked some fairly valid questions. You'd all agree there. What are you doing? Why are you doing it? How long is it going to take? And I don't think we'd ever talk to our boards with such a kind of curt, dismissive fashion, but, you know, hand on heart, the guys who work as practitioners or maybe as security leaders, could you honestly tell, not just your boards, but your different business units, why, for example, you have a malware sandbox, why you have an IPS device, what do your proxy server do? And I don't mean what it physically does with TCP packets, I mean why you have it in your environment. And I think these are the challenges that we have. Some of the simplest questions are so profoundly difficult. And that's really, as I've experienced in both the user world and vendor world, I spent the best part of 17 years working as an architect, a designer, a CISO, an engineer in security. And we're very good at the technical minutiae. I don't think we're necessarily particularly good at conveying why that's a particular challenge. So, what are some of the important questions? And I have various versions of this deck depending on where I am, how long I have on stage. But today, I've kind of boiled it down to sort of three pressing questions, and I, and I hope these are relevant by this audience. Chris, could not Petra impact our business? And you could replace not Petra with any form of crypto ransomware, DDoS attack, SQL injection vulnerability is being exploited, whatever it is. I think. If, if my experience is anything to go by, I think some of the answers, or the most honest way that people would respond to this, I don't know if there's a big chart out there, people can see that, but I think the response that a lot of organisations have is, well, yes, it probably could. We're not particularly sure of our kind of endpoint posture. We don't necessarily know how many devices that we have or even managed or are managed. How many people out here have challenges with a CMDB? We were talking previously about like, data privacy and GDPR. 
But having that CMDB, if you're in a position where you need to contain a particular cyber attack, some form of business disruption that's in your estate, what are you qualifying by way of metrics of assets that you can actually control? So that's my first question. How much would it cost to be secure? This is a particularly hard one to answer for, for various reasons. I mean, firstly, and slightly philosophically, what does secure mean? Who in your, def in your environment is kind of defining that? Um, I'm sure most people in this room are familiar with the concept of risk tolerance. But that's what we as CISOs and security leaders are, are kind of there to do, right? Reduce risk to a palatable level for that particular environment. But all too often, we're not told what that is. You know, we go to the board on a monthly basis, we have a rack status, and from month to month, someone will say, yes, we accept that risk, we don't accept that risk, but not really understanding what the business impact is there. And if we're not doing that, I'm not really sure how we can possibly say what secure means. And how long will it take to be secure? I think that's a massive challenge as well. It's a major challenge because security, and I don't want to talk in truism, it's too much to that, but it has to be an ongoing process. I think a lot of organisations feel there's a start and a finish to a security programme. I've been involved in, in various different roles with programmes of that nature where there seems to be this business perception that once we get to the end of a three-year security programme, we've done all that cyber stuff and we can move on and do other things. And that for me really is a message around education and awareness, which if we don't have, we can't really provide any, any meaningful metrics, in my opinion. So yes, how long is a piece of string? I don't think it depends is going to cut it. So there's a lot of panic with applying metrics. I think what we're good at is data. I think in our industry we're fantastically good at producing data, assimilating data, having lots of it. Getting information from that data is something which is kind of infinitely harder. I think that's something we haven't solved. It's certainly not looking like solving with targeted marketing and big data solutions, which all have you know, profoundly good uses for cyber security, but also a number of challenges which the guys were talking about, were talking about previously. Who's been asked this one? Anyone? How do we compare to our industry peers? You're kind of compounding the challenge that we have previously. I see a few people laughing. I don't ever know how to answer this one or to help anyone in the industry in my various roles to answer this. I mean, lots of, there's lots of solutions out there at the moment which we talk very technically about configurations. There are lots of vendors, some very good at what they do actually, which we look at, for example, an organisation's position around TLS certificates or where and how they're using SPF and DMARC and various technical things that give kind of an outside view of cyber. But qualifying the maturity of a third party organisation is an awful lot more than technical security. I mean, bloody hard. Like, when we, I think we really need to get our own metrics sorted out before we're in any position to talk about third parties. So at this point, we've gone to our board, we've told them we don't know how long it will take to be secure, we've told them we don't know how much it will cost to be secure, and we're not particularly sure what secure means, and we panicked a lot. So now we move on to a series of metaphors, proverbs, and truisms in cyber security. Has anyone heard this one of security is like painting the Golden Gate Bridge? Anyone heard that? I heard this maybe two years ago. And it's the worst metaphor for cyber security there could possibly be. And the view is the painters of the Golden Gate Bridge start at one end and they just aimlessly kind of paint from one end, they get all the way to the other end, they get to the other end because it's taken so long, they're now about time to start back at the start of the Golden Gate Bridge and paint it again. So firstly, it's a really depressing world if that's what we do in cyber security, just walk around no real priorities, we know we need to do some stuff, we're just going to carry out our job from day to day without any real alignment to business objectives or risks. So I looked at this and I thought, hmm, is that really how they paint the Golden Gate Bridge? And I'll come on to something I'm writing at the moment, but I did a lot of research into various different things and various things I was trying to disprove in our industry. And that isn't how they paint the Golden Gate Bridge. The Golden Gate Bridge is painted in a way that we should be looking at cyber security. So identifying specific areas of corrosion or areas that haven't had upkeep in, in the last year or so, and they're targeted in almost a, an agile way of working. So I start off by saying that painting the Golden Gate Bridge is an awful way of looking at cyber security, but if you actually understand how they paint the bridges, it's pretty much the way that we should be at it. way that we should be looking at things. So I don't know, I actually alienate a fair few people when I put this slide on the screen that I talked about recently around things that I think we say, and we don't really clarify what we mean by them. So with the exception of me trying to be funny with fancy bear in my homework, if you look at some of these other kind of truisms or statements that we make from a principles perspective, 
in cybersecurity. Each one of them is eminently sensible. But I feel and I see a lot of security strategy documentation. We touched on UK cyber strategy. This has been recorded. I'm not saying anything else. But you know, having statements like this is fantastic so long as we can tailor them for the audience that we're talking to. So security is obviously everyone's responsibility. But there has to be a top down message from your board of execs defining what's important to that organisation and having that in your policy statements. It's also primarily the CISO and the security function's responsibility to, for example, be defining the controls to reduce risk to lower the your environment. So, yes, of course, it's everyone's responsibility, but there are people in the organisation who have more responsibility than others. Um, we need to embed ourselves into business strategy. Has anyone heard that? It's a phrase. I think in a world where every company is a technology company, we kind of are pretty intrinsically appropriate and important to that business strategy. We shouldn't necessarily be embedding ourselves, we should be defining core attributes of that business strategy. Um, skill shortage, of course we're experiencing a skill shortage. Um, automation can only get you so far, is what I would say. I think there's a lot of people out there kind of espousing the benefits of automation for everything. In my experience, automation is fantastic for, for example, high fidelity alerts from the incident response team, but you still need kind of a conductor of an orchestra when you're looking at automation solutions. So it's a big challenge. Prevention is dead. It's another one I hear. Prevention is dead. The way we apply prevention changes as we start to use myriad different technologies. And prevention, as in MD5 hashes and DAT files for prevention against sophisticated or contemporary malware, yes, I think that, I think that stat I had on ASP for ZSG, I think um, kind of 4% we saw in our cloud of all the threats we blocked with signature based AV, that's not a plug for anyone, that just shows kind of these legacy antiquated ways of, of looking at contemporary challenges, I think, as well. Um, the other two, like I said, fairly self explanatory. Cyber security is about people, process, and technology, but not in isolated silos. How we work together is all about having very well um, educated, experienced people, but if we don't have the right, kind of, I suppose, playbooks and wrong books for cyber security, if we don't have the right standards and patterns, we, we don't really have any chance of having repeatable process to it. And the last one is just because I wanted to put it in there. So we're now at a stage where we have our board incredibly, incredibly, incredibly frustrated. They're paying us so lots of money, this big security team, we have lots of tools. And then we come to them with a board presentation about these three areas. So we talk to them about the challenges and vulnerabilities with distributed ledgers, blockchain. We tell them there are going to be 50 billion actuators and sensors online by 2020x, I can't remember the latest report. And we also tell them that big data, as I've said earlier, the aggregation of all this information is going to start causing us challenges from a data privacy perspective, from the ability to delete anything and understand the importance and categorization of our information. So what I've done in the first part of this is kind of, I suppose, set the scene or a backdrop of the challenges that we have. I'll, I'll now continue to look at um, some of the things that I think we should be doing, it's not all doom and gloom, there are some repeatable things that we can do in our industry to produce meaningful metrics levels. Start with this. Um, security strategy needs to be many things, but it also needs to be, or primarily needs to be aligned to business objectives. So if the CISO, you know, the senior person in security in your organisation doesn't have a regular cadence with the business leaders in each kind of vertical in your organisation, Understanding, and we're not talking about technology here, at a business process level, understanding what they want to do as their own organisation within that company. It might be, for example, um, reducing the time from order delivery online to a customer receiving an item. It might be something as simple as improving the perception of this organisation as a technology innovator. Things like that. They're not to do with IPSs, they're not to do with sandboxes, they're to do with what that organisation kind of there to do. If you can define your strategy actually aligned to business objectives, you're in a much better position to be able to, I suppose, serve your business and evidence value. We say in our industry fairly regularly about return on investment, but in my experience anyway, like again, I don't want to you know, alienate myself here, but investment infers some way of return. So if I go to my bank and I put a thousand pounds in, I'm expecting in five years time to have more than a thousand pounds. I think in security we don't get that. It's really, really hard to prove a negative, isn't it? You spend a million dollars on a DDoS solution, you don't have a DDoS attack for a year, do you need to renew that DDoS 
solution because you're going to have executives turn around and say, oh, this is all my job, we haven't had any challenges over the last 12 months. So much more around value and business alignment than anything around investment, I would say. And those six phases, I can't remember for the life of me where we first many years ago got them from, but they're not in any way unique to me. They've been established before. Where are you now? Where is your organisation from a cyber security maturity perspective? How are you establishing that? You know, are you looking at kind of common criteria? Are you using CMI, for example, to establish a level of maturity across a number of areas? And where do you want to be and why? This is a fantastic one. Talk to organisations like worked in organisations where we sit, we want to raise our maturity from nascent capability through to gold plated. But if we can't align this kind of just nebulous gold plated security back to a series of risks, it's incredibly hard to understand and justify financially why you're actually doing it. Also, what do you need to change? How do you get from where you are to where you want to be? I mean, actually delivering your changes is incredibly challenging as well. Projects are a kind of waterfall methodology. I still see lots of major programs of work that subscribe to that, but getting the security function embedded cross-functionally in kind of development activity, you know, invariably that is now delivering code at a rate of knots. That's now virtualized infrastructure delivered through Puppet and Chef. You're not getting three months to tell you know, one of your business units, we need to pen test, we'll come back to you in three weeks. You know, that's, that's the work of yesteryear, and it's not really a, anything that we can help anymore, I don't think. Um, so I mentioned earlier on writing some work, I'll look at my own details at the end, but it talks about kind of the cyber security risk equation in a little bit of detail. I think what we previously have, some organisations still subscribe to this, is we have impact ties by likelihood equals risk. Incredibly hard for us to work within the confines of something so vague and opaque. Okay. So this isn't mine as such. If you look at NIST 830, you look at the ISF IRAM framework, you look at CIS IRAM, you look at anything really in information risk management, these are kind of the steps you have. You have an actor, that actor may be nefarious and maybe accidental. They initiate some form of threat event, again, various myriad of those. Exploit vulnerabilities and they cause business impact. So I would say, racing through this now, looking at the time, I would say that we in the cybersecurity function, we need to do a metric scoreboard, we're incredibly good at this bit. I mentioned Fancy Bear at my homework before, but we're good at understanding, especially nefarious actors, we're in a position to be able to advise our kind of business stakeholders on that side of things. Pretty good at threat events, certainly the pen test reports that I read when we talk about SQL injection, cross site request forgery, when we talk about DDoS, when we talk about process injection from a malware perspective, great. Pretty good vulnerabilities as well. Heartbleed um, being a particularly good example here, spectrum meltdown, being able to identify something that technically could be exploited to cause uh, business impact. But we're rubbish at business impact. So when we're producing these metrics for our board, if your organisation, we talked about maturity earlier, if we don't have, for example, BIAs, business impact assessment documentation, or ain't GDPRs or DPIAs, so an understanding of the assets, data and physical, that are being used for your business processes, how important from a confidentiality, integrity, and availability perspective is said asset to that organisation. And if you don't know that, I don't really understand how we can do any of the rest of this, or we can ever answer that question of, and is good, or is good good enough? Do we need to be better than good? Do we have particular assets of critical importance? How long can they be offline for? What happens if they go offline? If this pop it, I'll start that again. If this box gets popped, do I have to inform the ICO? If you don't understand, you don't have an asset register, you don't have visibility of your assets, you don't know what's out there, I think that's impossible when you're fighting losing battle. So I have two or three, three uh, slides left before I open for questions. Two out of three ain't bass. Do you know which 80s rock legend sang that? Yes. So, yeah, this man. So, two out of three ain't bad from an 80s rock hits perspective, but also from a cyber security program delivery, which is pretty tenuous, but, um, perspective. So, cyber security, you can have it cheap and quick. Generally speaking, it's going to be insecure. You can have it quick and secure. Quite often that's going to be bloody expensive. Or you can have it secure and cheap, assuming you've established what secure means, but it's going to be delayed. And I think that's one of the biggest challenges we have when we go to our executives for funding. We say we're going to deliver I don't know, 
17 projects in three months, we don't have the resources, we then deliver half of what we said, half of what we said isn't appropriate for the risks and the data that we've got. So no one's happy that we've reached this halfway house. Um, to satisfy some of that, I wrote a series, I used to write for CSO magazine, and I wrote a series for them last year, I, I'll send it across the link to it, around how we better speak with our boards. And I broke it down into kind of business objectives, which we've talked about today, but then kind of key risk indicators and key performance indicators. So for me, a risk indicator is kind of like a forward-looking view of cyber security. So you've identified via your business engagement what's important to your organisation. So hopefully they're not going to be particularly technical. They're going to be a case of where's your organisation going, what do they want to achieve, how are they going to get there. And then you would look at any area where there could be material disruption to satisfy those business outcomes, right? As a, as a broad, that's a 40,000 foot view of this. But that's, that's sufficing for, for today. They're kind of your risk indicators that would then affect, oh, fantastic, yes, but they affect your business outcomes. It's at that point, and I could tell anyone here because these just happen to be some that I'm working on with, with, with several people at the moment, but it's at that point you start to look at performance indicators. So number of mach web facing machines with their firewall turned on or off, as the case is actually probably more pertinent, is only useful if you understand the sensitivity and criticality of the machines in question. You understand why the business has those machines and how that aligns back to business objectives. Um, again, percentage of unapproved established outbound network connections, that in isolation, and I've seen this happen before, if you're taking that in an Excel spreadsheet and you're waving that in front of your CFO, he isn't going to have or she isn't going to have a clue what you're talking about. So traceability between these KPIs, which are kind of backward looking, they're an assessment of either your current or your previous state in your environment, aligned back to your risk indicators, and at that point, those should be aligned back to these business objectives. So having generalised risk indicators that have no real traceability back to business outcomes is a challenge, I would say. Um, yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kind of wrap up on this slide. Um, shameless plug for a bit of writing. But basically, I take a number of different points that I've talked about today, and I'm going to put them together in a book on risk management, because I think this very vague impact times by likelihood equals risk doesn't work. I think we're talking metaphors and jargon in our industry and people, there were some very senior people coming into cyber security with a very strong business background. We're kind of getting indoctrinated into a way of thinking which is, you know, everything's highly sophisticated, there's no point defending anything and other various truisms I've talked about today.